So we're inspecting the uh, surface of the stone and looking for cutting scratches. And I think I got all the cutting scratches out, but it's still uneven. It's still rough. Um, and I may have to go back over it. Um, I also, uh, I'm using these brush things to uh, do the sanding, um, and they don't uh, smooth the surface. They, they will clean down in little crevices and, and leave the bumps. Um, so I may just have to do more sanding. Or I may have to go to a um, a felt buff with diamond on it, and that's how I've usually done it till I found these things. Um, so I may go to a felt buff and use a a coarse grit diamond. <clears throat> to smooth this off. Um, but I got all the cutting scratches out pretty much. Uh, and that's good. Uh, they're, uh, when you cut by hand, that's not always easy to do because sometimes you, you get deeper gouges than you want to get. Um, But it's turning out nice, man. I... Happy with this stone. And what I'm doing here is I'm I'm going with the reflection of my my light and looking. This is the the lines you see here are natural lines that were on the stone when I started out, and it's very smooth there, or it was, uh, and and now I'm I'm bringing in my uh, my little zooper and and taking out some of the irregularities, but not much. I I don't mind having the lines in there. Um, The stone is actually clear. You can see right through it. Not right through it, but, you know, it's uh, on the clear side of translucent. Um, when you hold it up to a light. But the play of color is so strong that you don't actually see that much when you're looking at it like this. So it's actually a little brown rock. Um, and the yellow is just a play of color. Yellow and orange and green and red and blue even. It's a nice one. So I haven't been working this side too much. I, I, ignoring it for the time being and I, I probably uh, we put them on a stick with some 
glue or, or uh, wax. Called a dop stick, uh, and I may put it on a dop stick to work this side. It, it's real hard to hold on to them when you're um, putting a lot of pressure on and you know moving around and trying to get into places. Um, There appears to be a fault line through there. And it's been there since I started cutting. Well, I mean, before I started cutting, even. Um, kind of pointed it out when I first started. And it hasn't gone anywhere so far, so, you know. And, and it has to do with this line right here, which is part of the natural line of the, of the crystallization. They say that this stuff is uh, amorphous, but uh, I think when you find um, unit cells in rows and columns, uh, it's probably a cubic structure. Uh, and it may have been the cubic structure that became glass-like in a high heat um, situation. That's kind of what I'm leaning towards in my, uh, in my theories. Uh, I thought I had it figured out there for a while about uh, the formation of precious opal as a chemical thing. And... and Worked with a guy out of MIT for a year or so, um, and he convinced me that I was uh, full of shit because I hadn't asked the right questions. I had uh, read the books, and I knew all the answers from the books correctly. Uh, and my, if the books have been correct, um, my chemical stuff might have worked, uh, but the books weren't correct, um, obviously, because this is not five and a half on the Mohs scale of hardness. Let me see if I can pause this. Diamond out of the Gila River, right near my house. And um, what I do is I check them on sapphires or rubies. And, you know, not these particular ones, but I, I have many, 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 many rocks. Um, let's go back now. These guys, which are mm, rainbow diamonds, actually. And the, the thing about diamonds is that they, they're made out of carbon. Um, and just carbon, right? That's why they're so clear. There's no other things in there, and it's just carbon atoms. And they're all squeezed together, and they share double-double covalent bonds, which makes them 10 on the most scale of hardness. Um, covalent bonds are the strongest bonds because they're sharing electrons from both sides of the atomic bond. Um, and so, uh, and these have uh, uh, one in the middle and six around around it, and that makes, uh, makes like a cube, right? 
you think about a box, it's got a top and a bottom and a front and a back and a side to side. Uh, and, and so that's what makes a diamond um, cubic. And the, the, it goes all the way down to the smallest structures. Um, and in this case, the, 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 they join together in unit cells, which are, I think, 13 atoms. Um, and if you go back to that six, there are three on the uh, six around the outside. There are three on the top and three on the bottom. Uh, and one in the middle, and that makes 13. Okay, and that's a nice round Fibonacci number. Um, and so I'm going with 13. Uh, I think the, the math would add up correctly. Um, but maybe not. Maybe they're bigger. Maybe they're 21, or maybe they're 34. Um, and I don't know, because... My uh, my electron microscope isn't working real good right this minute because I'm not working real good right this minute. I actually have one uh, that I've developed in here in the Mountain Smith Workshop and Laboratory. Um, but these are diamonds, and, and the way that you uh, test a whether it's a diamond or not is to see if it will scratch a ruby or scratch another diamond, right? So I can go like this. This will scratch a ruby. This, this sharp point right here will scratch a ruby. Whoops. And I know because I checked uh, more than once, and there's some videos showing me scratching rubies with this particular chip of stuff. But it won't scratch my rainbow diamonds because it's tin. On, they're both tin on the Mohs scale of hardness. Okay. So, back to... Mm -mm. Hmm. Now we're in trouble. my little rock. <laughs> I'm going to test it in public. And I uh, don't know where it went. Damn. Okay, here we go again. So we got this sharp, pointy part. And we got this kind of smooth part here. that I'd been working on, but it's, you know, it's not really smooth. Let me see if I can... And you can hear it. Hear me scratching on it. And if it were five and a half on, a, on the Mohs scale of hardness, it would be like glass and the... Uh, Diamonds scratch glass really easy and leave big gouges. And as you can see, it did not affect my stone here at all. And I was rubbing right in there. Not rubbing, I, I was using that sharp pointy part on my diamond. And holding this and honking down on that as hard as I could. Oops. Let's see if I can. Ah, look at that. We, we made some scratches now. Mm, bum. Just my thumb.
and we wiped the dust off. And and what I did actually was not make scratches on my on my little rock here. What I did was I wore some of the tip of my sharp pointy diamond off. Uh, the diamonds coming out of the Gila River are, are not like good diamonds. They're just diamonds. Carbon is not scarce or hard to find. Um, uh, good diamonds are. Mm, a little rare, not much. This is a rainbow diamond from China. And if you look at the Gobi Desert, it is in fact the, the central Gobi is shaped like a like a mm, exclamation point. And it is in fact a um, an impact crater. Now that is also the, it's the same phenomena that makes the colors in this stone. It's called Bragg diffraction. That's because the unit cells in my diamond are half the size of a wavelength of visible light. But this is cubic and, and um, you know, came out of the ground as a cubic crystal. This is kind of melted, and I think that's what the difference is. Uh, and the darkness is because of the presence of carbon um, 12 rather than carbon 13. Carbon 13 gives you clear diamond, and carbon 14 is what makes diamonds so darn sparkly because it gives off electrons uh, basically um, in the wavelength of the light that's exciting it. But that's not what this rainbows are. Um, this is Bragg diffraction. Um, and the, the stone is, in fact, clear. Um, and these are these are good diamonds, but they come from these lakes in Tibet uh, next door to the uh, central Gobi Desert because that big, it's a big, huge impact crater. The point of the, the exclamation point, uh, China mines uh, uranium there and they've got a big processing plant, looks like a swimming pool, big, huge swimming pool that you can see from uh, low Earth orbit, clearly. Um, and something hit there. Boom! And, and it hits at the point, and then, you know, it's great, and, and it bounced uh, out of the Gobi Desert. Um, but that impact from, from space hit at such a velocity uh, that, that it... Um, creates diamonds underneath and and the kimberlite pipes are formed from the impact of asteroids and so that's what creates um, the where they find the diamonds over in South Africa for instance um, and in the case of China it's this big, huge thing. It's like 2,000 kilometers long, uh, the Gobi Desert. And all of the things on the side were smooshed up against the, the mountains down south. Um, and so these lakes are full of this stuff. And I find the same stuff over in New Mexico in some lakes over there and it is in fact from an impact uh, we'll get to that some other time but that's what it's from they're, they're 
uh, the result of an impact of a of a large space going object that hit the ground at um, you know uh, if you fell from a hundred kilometers up you're the the you're going seventeen thousand kilometers an hour to to start with um in low Earth orbit, anyway, uh, and and from a hundred kilometers up, you'd be doing uh, almost five thousand meters per second when you hit the ground. If you fell from two thousand kilometers up, you get a second per second acceleration. And, and the fall is, is mostly through outer space, right? In the last couple of seconds or, or three seconds uh, are in atmosphere, and that's what we see when we when we see um, shooting stars, right? The um, It'll burn up a little rock. A little rock uh, smaller than this creates those things we call shooting stars uh, that don't actually hit the ground. The ones that hit the ground are like this big or bigger, and, and most of mine are about you know chicken egg size or something. Uh, and I've got hundreds of them from over by Safford. Uh, and so I've had a chance to study a few of them. And they were knocked up when the thing hit up into space, and they, they go up and up and up, but they're not doing 17,000 kilometers an hour. They, they, just, they reach zero velocity and then fall back down um, and become meteorites, a little, you know, little meteorites. But the, they've fallen fast enough where the, the stuff on the side is actually blackened, and uh, you can see where there was some ablation on the, on the lower surface and, and across the upper surface um, from the heat of re-entry that last three seconds. So geology is big fun but it's not magic. And you have to ask the right questions. And don't assume, I, I, I used to assume that I knew all the answers because I knew all the answers in the books. And my friend Michael from MIT helped me find out that I was... Uh, full of answers from the books, but not the right answers. Peace, y'all.